Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming and joining us here on this afternoon for uh, another uh, installment of our Tuesday Town Halls. I'm very happy to have two colleagues here that I don't think we've had on webinars before, and I'm very glad that they're joining us here for the first time. Uh, in order from left to right on my screen, we have Barbara McClure, who is Associate Professor of Pastoral Theology and Practice and the Director of Programs for Pastoral Thriving at Bright Divinity School at TCU. And Barr is also involved in the Educating Effective Chaplains program at Boston University that the lab is also involved in. So I'm really happy to have Barr here in that capacity as well. And then we're also joined by Reverend Cheryl Harris, who is uh, president of Cheryl Harris and Associates. And she can speak a little bit more to her work and how it is uh, relevant and engaging with you all as well. So with that in mind, let me turn it over to our panelist, Barr. I think you're going to go first, and then we can pick up with Cheryl at the end of that. Barr, take it away. Thank you, Michael. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, depending on where you are. Uh, Reverend Harris and I are hoping to present a little bit of material with you today and then have some question and answer with you. And we were asked to talk about change from an individual and an organizational or institutional perspective. Um, and so we're going to touch on that and then also offer some resources for ways to think our ways through and practice our ways through change. Um, I'm assuming that many of you, since, since your chaplains, have had some introduction to family systems theory or ways of understanding how power and anxiety work in organizations and systems. And we're going to, I'm going to draw on that a little bit, to at least touch on it. Um, so I'll just remind you briefly that organizations and individuals experience change similarly and also differently. And it's helpful to have some framework to think about what that can look like. Uh, Anxiety is a key theme in family systems theory, and when we can trace anxiety and, and find our ways through anxiety, that can be a very helpful uh, practice and orientation. Obviously, change is a huge source of anxiety, whether it's positive change or negative change, and both individuals and systems resist change because it, change always takes effort. It moves us out of a static place that's familiar and, um, and, and works for us. So one of the, in my classes, one of the ways I describe what happens in systems, for example, family systems, is that the change requires a, uh, the expansion of a rubber band and the pressure on the system is to release the pressure on that rubber band and go back to what was a, a more familiar status quo. Um, and so working through change is helpful to understand a system or a person will always resist that stretch in the rubber band. And knowing that systems and individuals are going to resist that stress can be helpful. Um, so I developed for another context and another group a metaphor that people found helpful that I thought I would share with you. And I developed this earlier on in the COVID experience, probably two months ago, uh, when things were still feeling really uncertain and we didn't, things were changing day to day and we didn't know what was happening. But I've since heard from folks by email and phone calls that this metaphor, which I'm going to share with you, was helpful to them and they keep coming back to it because it, it helps them navigate their own lives and the change in their own lives, but it also helps them support other people as they are experiencing change. So I thought it might be useful to you. And we were asked to, to because we're this is a town hall on caring for caregivers, we were asked to help uh, support your own caring for yourselves too. So we're hoping that this, this time together today will help you imagine how to care for yourself and also support others who are experiencing change. So the metaphor I developed was this. Imagine that somebody puts a blindfold on you. So just imagine that for, some, for a second and turns you loose in your home, whether it's an apartment or a house or a um, hostel or wherever you consider home. You're blindfolded and you're turned out into your home 
and you're told to go about your day the way you always do. Maybe you get up, you make coffee, cup of tea, maybe some hot chocolate. Maybe you sit by the window and watch the birds for a few minutes. Maybe you sit and pray for a while. Maybe you get up right away and rush out the door. Whatever your morning routine is, now you're being asked to go through that, but with a blindfold on. And now imagine that something like COVID hits and somebody, maybe the COVID virus, has moved all the furniture in your house. They've moved your coffee maker, they've moved your favorite mug, uh, maybe they've taken away some things, maybe your favorite chair has been taken away altogether. Maybe where you thought the couch once was, it no longer is. In fact, you don't have a couch anymore. And so you find yourself trying to move around your home, go about your daily routine, get the things done that you're expected to get done, whatever those things are, whatever you're used to getting done, but you're blindfolded and someone has entirely rearranged the furniture. And so you find yourself having to sort of crawl along the wall with your hands and feel your way slowly. Is that chair where I thought it was, where it usually is? Is my favorite coffee mug where I left it last night? So when we think about the metaphor, we realize everything in this kind of change that we're encountering now, everything takes more time, it takes more effort, it takes more intentionality. And we're all living right now with blindfolds on, both at home and at work and with family in every arena of our lives, we have blindfolds on. And because COVID pandemic has been a couple of months in the making now, we're maybe settling into a new routine, but we keep getting, getting changes in our lives because somebody removes another chair or somebody removes the sweater that we always put on in the evening. So things are constantly being moved and we still have blindfolds on. And yet the parts of ourselves that resist change that I was mentioning earlier still want to go back to the status quo. It still wants to bounce the, the rubber band back to a, to a stable place and not have it stretched. The institutions that we move in that we're moving in are putting a lot of pressure on us to, to either maintain the status quo, move around your house and move around your job as if you didn't have a blindfold on and move as quickly and efficiently as you usually do. I don't know about your institutional context, but my university almost immediately, probably within a week of uh, the pandemic being announced, developed this tagline that we were all going to, quote, ramp up rapidly. It was our job to ramp up rapidly. And I think that created a lot of resistance, with Rev which Reverend Harris is going to talk about a little bit later, but a lot of resistance, a lot of resentment, and a lot of chaos, because the institution itself wanted people to ramp up rapidly and just go on as if everything was the same without recognizing that people's lives had been entirely rearranged. The furniture was either removed or moved. And that when people went to sit in their familiar chair, they fell on the floor because their familiar chair was no longer there. And unless institutions and individuals can really honor the changes that are happening, it creates extra chaos and extra challenge for people. And what I wish our leadership had done was not try to get everybody to ramp up rapidly, but to give people an opportunity to pause and to feel their way a little bit more intentionally, to move with more awareness through their lives, which is what we have to do when we're blindfolded. You can't just take a step. You have to feel gingerly with your foot. But institutions and individuals often don't give us a chance to do that. So I'm hoping this metaphor might help you a little bit. Think, think through some of the things that have changed for you. We won't take time to actually uh, write 
answers to the questions I'm about to pose. But if, I, if this were more of a workshop setting, I might do that. And you might think along with me anyway about how you would answer this. So if, if we take the metaphor of being blindfolded in our home or in our familiar place of work, but things have been moved or removed, what, what might be the, what represents the furniture for you? What might have changed, what might have moved in your life uh, that you're having to navigate newly with blindfolds on? Maybe it's uh, the way you do your job. Maybe it's what you have to wear to work. Maybe it's where you do your job. Maybe some of you can't do chaplaincy in person anymore. You're having to find ways to do it virtually. So what is the furniture in your life that has been moved or removed that you're having to feel your way around and navigate your way around? How are the changes conscious or unconscious? I've been reading quite a bit around the, um, the emotional and psychic results of the, the global furniture having been moved with this pandemic. And there's been quite a, a lot of interesting reflection on the, the unconscious effects or the unconscious furniture that has been moved or removed. And one of those is facing our own mortality. We're not we're all facing, if you read the even just the headlines day to day, we're all faced with mortality and the mortality rates rising and the mortality rates differing among different demographics or, or in different geographical regions, etc. But death is in the air, so to speak, with us. And, and this one um, psychologist I was reading was arguing that that's a, that's a significant unconscious result of this pandemic that we're not talking about as much as we maybe should. So that would be some furniture that's been moved around in our psyches. Our, our mortality has been moved to the front, um, even if we're not aware of it. So what are the conscious and the unconscious furnitures that are moving in your world? What is it like to have to slow down and feel your way with the blindfold on, feel your way along the wall, move your foot out gingerly to see if that step that used to be there is still there? What is that like for you? What messages are you getting about how to, how to navigate this new world with a blindfold on? I just shared the one that I got from my institutional context. You must ramp up rapidly. This is what we expect of you. Um, and everything in me thought that was the wrong approach for students, for faculty, for staff. It certainly felt wrong for me. I, I couldn't actually ramp up rapidly. I was, I read for a living and I found it very difficult to even read or, or focus or remember what I was reading. I couldn't wrap up, ramp up rapidly and I wished that my institutional context had, had approached things differently. I might have been able to ramp up more quickly had I had some time to be quiet and pay attention and slow down and feel my way along the wall a little bit um, longer. So what messages are you getting about how you ought to be navigating this new home or workspace? What feelings come up for you as you have lost or lost pieces of furniture or pieces of furniture have been moved for you. I think as people who provide care, and I'm assuming most of you are chaplains who do provide care, um, it's important for us to realize, this is not new to you, I know, but it's important for us to realize not, that not everybody experiences the same thing in a, same, in a shared experience. So for some people, there's a lot of grief about losing their favorite coffee mug. For other people, when the, when the couch has been removed, there's a deep sense of relief because that couch was representing the rat race of their lives. And now they're being invited to slow down and get more intentional. So it's important for us to ask ourselves what our experience of that furniture, um, each piece of furniture that's being moved or removed is. And then also remember to be curious with other people what their experience of their lives and their furniture moving or being removed uh, has been. We can't assume. Um, for some people, it's a very helpful thing. I had a, a student who is identifies on the spectrum of autism and 
uh, he he wrote me an email saying it was this was a really helpful thing for him because he was allowed to stay home where there was less stimulus, where he didn't have to go out and navigate the streets or or classroom space or whatever. Um, and that was a helpful reminder for me. So for some people, this is a positive thing. The changes are positive, but that's not true for everybody. And I don't, I don't know what your experience is, but it's worth asking ourselves, what, what are we experiencing as this furniture moves? What resources are there to help guide you along the walls of your house or through the furniture? And Dr. Uh, Reverend Harris is going to talk some about some of those resources, I think, about um, ways to support ourselves. And I'll, I'll leave that to her. But uh, what, do you need to, what do you need to be able to navigate these changes? You're blindfolded, you're finding your way around. What do you need to navigate? So in sum, I think I, I want to, drawing on the metaphor of the furniture being moved or removed and the blindfold, I want to encourage us um, about the importance of identifying what's different and new, identifying and naming the feelings that accompany that newness, identifying the messages we're getting about how we ought to be navigating it. Are you being told to ramp up rapidly Go, go along as if you did not have a blindfold on and things were normal at your home or your work. In some ways, living with and experiencing the feelings around the change can be helpful. Just giving ourselves a break to say, wow, everything's be, been rearranged and I can't figure out how to, how to navigate my world right now. And letting that be okay for a while, that having that space is legitimate. And then finally, what, what sources of support are there for you as you try to navigate this new world? Where do you get nourishment? Where do the people you're caring for get nourishment? Their, their furniture will be different from yours. The institution's furniture will be different from yours. But at all levels, change is going to be resisted and probably has been resisted. And it's not too late for us to cycle back and say, you know, maybe ramping up rapidly was not the best idea. Maybe it wasn't the best institutional slogan. Maybe we could have come up with something a little bit better that would have helped people make the adjustments to navigate their, their new structures of their lives in ways that take time and take effort. So I'm happy to come back to any of this in, in conversation, but I'll turn it over to Reverend Harris and she can um, do her piece and then I think we'll open to Q&A. Thank you, Professor McClure. It's a pleasure to be here. I have a dual career. Uh, I've been pastor of a church for the last eight years now and have been operating in this COVID-19 environment along with everyone else and learning what it means to change and change as uh, Professor McClure was saying rapidly. One day we were able to meet in the sanctuary and then we weren't and there were changes that were required that we had to make and a lot of anxiety got produced. So I want to give you a little bit of my background and then talk about this process of coaching I received my formal training as a coach in 2009 at an organization called Coach for Life. And what makes Coach for Life unique from other kinds of coaching environments is that it relies on a spiritual approach to coaching. And that spiritual approach says that clients access their own answers in their own individualized connection to spirit, to their God, or to their sense of divine presence. And as I listened to Professor McClure talk about change and what moves and moving things and having blindfolds on, what happens if we have a spiritual connection is that that's constant, that stays the same, that doesn't change, that's not subject to these consequences and events that happen. There's a constancy about the spiritual connection that helps us to tap into what's true and real for me always, as opposed to based on the events that are going on around me. So as a certified coach, 
I wanted to talk to you about three areas, just touch upon three areas of coaching. And then as uh, Professor McClure said, we'll open it up to questions and comments that you may have. So the three things I want to touch upon are the main thing, the art of inquiry, and addressing anxiety. So the main thing is that we are spiritual beings having a human experience. And we touch the very souls of individuals just by our presence. When people are in the midst of change and anxiety and uncertainty, they need to know that I am not in this by myself, that I am connected to someone in some way. And oftentimes we think that we have to do a lot. And sometimes all we have to do is be present, to be aware and uh, with people. And that is enough. So with spiritual beings having a human experience, and then I personally am inspired by Paul Tillich's quote, that the first language of love is to listen. And I think that the coaching experience is one where we get to express love of human being, and we do that through listening. So this main thing, being a spiritual being and listening, listening intently and compassionately to support people in being aware, aware of their beliefs, aware of their actions, and how those beliefs and actions align with their values and their goals. I can't tell you the number of times I've had conversations with people who are spinning because of all that's going on. What do I do? Where do I go? How do I know what tomorrow will bring? And being able to get them to focus in again on what is most central and core for them helps them to realign themselves with their values. So the coach's main job is to listen compassionately and intently and to recognize the spiritualness of each person, even if someone is not identifying a particular entity as their spiritual connection. Whatever they see as their higher connection is what we tap into. As a coach with the spiritual grounding, I don't use a lot of spiritual language or refer to people with biblical references because I know that I'm a spiritual being in the human experience and they are too. That leads me to how do we make sure that people understand how they're connecting or aligning with their values and their goals? And that's where we get to the art of inquiry. So for me, I view coaching as a reflective learning process and therefore see it as essential to help coaches access their own information with good quality open-ended questions. And often when people are in anxiety or stressed out, they want someone to listen to them, but they often don't know what to say. So sometimes a well-placed question, a good open-ended question helps them focus. And so open-ended questions are very important. They help with that reflective learning process, help people tap into what they need to find out where is my anchor, my center, what are my beliefs and my values, are my actions aligning with those beliefs and values? Questions like, what do you want to create? What values do you bring to this issue, this challenge, this opportunity? Simply asking, what do you want? What do you want? Will help to navigate some of the furniture movement that Professor McClure talked about. And then, Questions like, what are you willing to do? What are you willing to do today, this week? Helps focus mind, heart, body on an action. Questions like, what's important to you? And what is your part in this? Those kinds of questions send people on a path to discover their own unique responses. They're responses that are based on their own inner connection and not based on what the pat others are doing, what their peers are doing, what's going on around them. What is it that I need? What do I want? What do I want to make happen today? So two of the main things is uh, two of the, the things regarding coaching that I want to touch upon is the main thing, the listening, of course, the questions. 
And then thirdly, addressing anxiety. And I have a visual aid to help us understand this last component of addressing anxiety. Thank you, Michael, behind the scenes. And uh, in the coaching world, what we're doing is we're developing trusting relationships. But in my work as uh, my consulting firm, Cheryl Harrison Associates, my focus is on diversity, equity, inclusion. So I'm often thinking about what is the cultural difference that might get in the way or how does race affect this relationship that I'm having in addition to all these other changes that I'm dealing with. So the barriers to developing trusting relationship fall into two of these quadrants that I have here, protective hesitation and protective defensiveness. Now, these are this is a concept that was framed by Professor Stacy Blake Beard. And what she talks about is that protective hesitation that occurs when we're most worried or afraid of offending someone. And this, when we're interacting often with people who are culturally different from us, race, age, gender, gender orientation, any of those identities, it's very common to worry about saying the wrong thing or not uh, expressing yourself in a way that is offensive to the other person. The problem is if we want to have a healthy and productive coaching relationship and one that's based on trust, then we have to avoid being hesitant to provide information, to say what needs to be said and to do the things that need to be done to help the person move along that continuum of becoming their best selves. So if we're hesitant to ask a question or if we're hesitant to offer information for fear of offending the coachee or the person, then we miss the opportunity to help that person discover their own magnificence, if you will, to become their best selves or to identify an area for expansion. So protective hesitation, that fear of offending does not serve the coaching relationship. And I suspect that that feeling of hesitation is even more heightened when we are in the midst of massive change that feels so out of our control. So the coach and the uh, chaplain, it's important to be self-aware. Where am I right now? How am I feeling? Am I feeling stable and clear and willing to be honest? Or am I worried and afraid? And if the worry and fear are paramount and prioritize over the relationship, then trust cannot be built. On the other hand, Protective defensiveness also gets in the way. Protective defensiveness is building walls around you to avoid getting hurt. And if the person on the other side of the conversation on in the partnership with the coach, the coachee is afraid of being offended, afraid that um, the person has malintent or is not willing to be honest with them and therefore builds up this wall of protection then that defensiveness also gets in the way of developing a trusting relationship. So protective defensiveness prevents important information from getting through in the same way that protective hesitation resists giving important information. Again, being aware of the source of one's anxiety can be helpful in addressing and minimizing these concepts, these ways of being, and move us into a place of willingness to be vulnerable. In order for the coach and the coachee to have an authentic relationship, then they have to be willing to address the anxiety and minimize it so that they can be their best selves and their most helpful. In my mind, coaching is a calling and it requires humility, vulnerability, and the embrace of what I 
like to think of as the Mobius, the give and take, if you will. So you give and you receive, you give and you receive, and particularly in relationships where trust is being built, there has to be the willingness not only to be a coach or an expert, but to also be a coachee and to learn from the person that you're working with. When we do that, when we tap into that spiritual component of ourselves, learning to listen, learning to ask questions and being willing to be self-aware and to make changes so that we're not operating out of fear, then we're able to build the kind of trusting relationships and have some central focus and connection to one another. So with that, I'll close and uh, we'll open up for questions for Professor McClure and myself. Wonderful, well, thank you all. Thank both of you so much for, for your insights. Uh, clearly, you're coming at this from two very different directions, but um, the, the applicability, I think, is, is, is evident. Let me just get into the Q&A function here and remind everyone, you do have a question function on your little control bar there on the right. So uh, anything that comes up, please do drop it in there and we will ask uh, the panel here. Also, I've seen a couple people you know, coming in and out. If you need to leave, no problem. These are recorded as with all of our other webinars. So if you need to leave or whatever, you can always view this after the fact on the Chaplaincy Innovation Lab website. So no worries. Uh, and if you miss anything, if you miss taking a note or a point or whatever, we will get this material on the website as well along with the recording. So you can take right. advantage of these insights beyond just today. So let me start with one question here that is, it, it's phrased as more of a, of a comment, but I'm gonna ask it as a question. This person says, I'm an MDiv student and was nearing the, the end of my first CPE unit in March. Now it's on hold indefinitely and I can't contact any of the patients. And I also can't see a client who lives in a nursing home. It's very frustrating, uh, but, and, and this person is trying to be patient, but there's a lot of anxiety and grief behind the furniture being moved. I think the question is, how do we deal with the furniture being moved when we don't know when it's done moving. You know, to walk in and say, whoa, 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 everything's different. In theory, I can get used to that. But if I don't know that it's gonna stay there for a while, so what do we do? Bar, how do you how do you add continuous movement into that equation and come out with something useful? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I two things come to mind. One is uh, especially in the moment we're in right now, the global moment, uh, change is not one and done. It's constant. So we put the blindfold on and we learn the new way of, of navigating around our home or our workspace, but someone comes in overnight and moves it again. And I think it's important to acknowledge and remember that. We, this is not going, we're not going to immediately adjust to a new way of being because things are constantly fluid right now. Um, and so, so recognizing the effort and the time and the energy, both psychic and physical energies, to navigate these new worlds is really important. We cannot expect ourselves to ramp up rapidly and have everything go back to, to normal um, anytime soon, even, even the new normal. We, I've heard a lot about adjusting to the new normal. The new normal is changing all the time. And I think it's helpful for us to give ourselves and each other permission to say, wow, this new way of being, this constantly adjusting, constantly relearning, feeling our way against the wall, um, brings up a lot of different feelings, grief. I think the, the questioner or the commenter had that word um, as you read it, a lot of grief, and that is absolutely legitimate. Um, and that's going to be ongoing. And if we can't give ourselves and each other permission to name that and live with it for a while and find new way and slow down to sort of gingerly put our foot out forward and feel our next step. Um, if we can't find permission for that, I think that will make things more difficult. Um, the other thing I want to name, and I'm, maybe Reverend Harris has a comment she'd like to add, but... One of the things we've lost right now is certainty. That was my couch. You know, I, my couch was in front of the fireplace and that was, that was the couch represent that in this particular metaphor, that couch is certainty. 
And I think it's it's worth naming that losing that is is an enormous effort and challenge and it's grief inducing change we want to be able to go back to how things were but things are unfolding all the time and i hear the losses in your comments um, that were just read those are significant you can't do the work you feel called to do or not in the same way you're used to doing it anyway you can't care for people that you care about um, those are significant losses and then identifying those and naming them and acknowledging it takes a lot of work to to re reformulate a life and it's ongoing is is really important good question yeah i would like to also add agree with all that uh bar is saying that we have to be willing to ask ourselves some questions during this process too to acknowledge the grief and the sadness of the loss and to also ask ourselves, what's most challenging for me about this situation? What is the most challenging? And once we identify that, what do I need? What do I personally need in this time? What do I want? And taking the time to explore that inventory, to do that work, helps us to get to the place to decide, so what do I need to do now? If I know what's challenging most, if I know what I need, I know what I want, what do I do? And the what, the want and the need has to go beyond, I want my job the way it was. It mm -hmm. has to be something deeper. Uh, there's a wonderful book by Byron Katie, B-Y-R-O-N-K-A-T-I-E. It's called Loving What Is, Loving What Is. And basically what Byron Katie is saying is that we can't often change some of the things that are happening. So we have to learn to accept and embrace what is and then move into the what's next. So I, I would encourage the uh, commenter to think about when I return to the work that I love to do, how will I do it? How will I show up? How will I help others through situations that I'm going through now? These are really, really helpful ways of thinking about um sort of the the conference the one-on-one -on -one confrontation with ourselves but there's another aspect here and our mutual colleague shelly rambo asks an excellent question here many chaplains are worried about having their jobs cut this was true before covid and it's especially true now what do they do in the face of of the fear if i don't ramp up i'm going to lose my job mm -hmm. you know dealing with uncertainty on our own is one thing but what if we have other people saying no this is the way you need to do things right now um you know so an external imposition how do we deal with all of this when there are pressures from the outside that might sort of militate against grappling with these issues thank you shelly yeah thanks for that question i think that's the, it's the hardest part for us is to recognize how we don't have control and to live in the ambiguity. So what do we do when we don't know what to do? And sometimes we have to just operate in that stillness and that waiting. And others feel very comfortable doing some research. So what skills do I have? How transferable are those skills? Where else could I use these skills? Who do I know? What conversations do I need to engage in with others so that I have some pathway to something different. Uh, so I think it's important to sit with the ambiguity, to get the stillness of that, but also to think about where are my resources? What resources do I have and how can I utilize those resources? Barbara, I would agree and underscore that. I would also want to add that a lot of chaplains are caregivers for doctors, administrators, not just patients. And I don't know if that's folks' experience on this call, but um, in my case, I had administrators who were really, um, sometimes it felt like shoving this idea of ramping up rapidly down my throat. Mm -hmm. And it was helpful for me to be able to recognize that that came out of their own anxiety, that the desire to return to things as they were before, to normal, the old normal, not a new normal even, or quickly ramp up to a new normal, which looked was supposed to look a lot like the old normal, just with some different <laughs> um, 
that that was coming out of their anxiety. So when I felt my own personal resistance or my resentment coming in, it was helpful to take a step back and think, okay, institutions and leaders of institutions have their own levels of anxiety. And of course they want the rubber band to snap back to its, its um, mm -hmm. static position, but that's not going to happen. So how can I care for them, even as they are in leadership over me? How can I recognize if you're a chaplain, maybe you're a, um, you're caring for administrators again, or doctors, or how, how can I be a part of a system that helps bring the anxiety down, that helps organizations and leaders name what's happening for them? Because they have the power to, to send out the message, right? We've got to ramp up rapidly. But there's a reason that they want to do that. And the reason is anxiety in the face of change. And if we can help them just in the way we interact with them and the questions we pose to them in our own self-awareness that invites them to their self-awareness, um, that can be a very useful function in an organization. Um, just having those conversations. I, I brought it up in faculty meeting a couple of times. It's not necessarily popular, but, um, but it can be useful. So I'm thinking about the quest or uh, Dr. Rambo's question, what about people losing their jobs? I, I hear that pain of that, that that's a piece of furniture that's being moved or removed. And I hear the that's anxiety. The that's, that's the house. house. <laughs> the whole house is okay. Good, nice extension of the metaphor. Um, and I wonder, I wonder whether there might be opportunities, and maybe the answer is no, but I wonder whether there might be opportunities to ask ourselves in those moments, is, is that the house I want to live in? Mm -hmm. if it's a really stressful context. It's a, if, it's a, if it's a home that, that creates a lot of anxiety in my, my own life or is led in certain ways that are really not life-giving, um, is there any space for me to imagine building something different, a different home? Um, for some people, the answer is no, and I understand that. But for some people, the answer is yes. And and if we can spot those opportunities, that might be life-giving in the end, even as it will be very painful moving out of that house. Um, yeah, I think that's right, painful. And we're not without options. Oftentimes we think, this is the only way, this is the only direction I can go in. But in fact, there are options. And when we allow ourselves to rest and relax enough, we can often see what those various options are. And giving ourselves an opportunity to think through, is this the house I want to live in? What other houses are available? What other neighborhoods can I go to? Would be helpful. Cheryl, there's a, a question here for you that I think is a nice way of of, of kind of concretely putting what you've said into practice. Mm. This person says, I find being vulnerable helps me connect with people. So addressing the protectiveness here, but I worry about how much is too much. Mm. So how do we prevent going too much in the other direction to where vulnerability hurts either ourselves or the people that we're working with? Yeah, it's such a great question, right? How do I protect myself from not being too protective? <laughs> it's a challenge. And how do you know? This is why it's so important to become self-aware. What are the boundaries that I need to set in place? Because vulnerability doesn't mean I'm totally open to anything and anyone at any time. That would be far too much. So determining how much of yourself are you going to expose be vulnerable and allow your feelings to connect to the other person without compromising your own focus and center and being. Uh, and that's not a question anyone can answer except yourself. When do I feel most vulnerable? And when do I need to protect myself? And that was, I'm sure, will happen moment by moment, encounter by encounter, uh, but not to abuse yourself. And if you tend to give far too much of yourself, that's uh, exploration for you and work for you to do in terms of why do I do that? When did I start doing that? And how might I begin to pull back enough so that I am still available and accessible and helpful to people? So One of the, the ways I, I often teach about that, Michael, and questioner is um, that 
it's helpful to be able to distinguish when we are sharing out of wounds and when we are sharing out of scars. Mm -hmm. So as a caregiver, um, when I'm in class, I often try to help students imagine what their wounds are and what their scars are. And if we can, if we can care out of scars, then we can draw on our own experience that's been healed such that it increases empathy for the other, but it doesn't make, it doesn't turn the focus on us so that we can, we're using our scarred experience as something, as a tool to increase the self-knowledge or empathy or whatever it is with another person or an institution. Um, when we, when we share out of our wounds, we, we tend to become the patient. So That's pastors that, that preach of their own wounds that are still bleeding, maybe they become the center of concern and focus for parishioners in ways that are not appropriate or helpful. Mm -hmm. But if pastors and chaplains can share out of their wound, uh, their scars, wounds that have healed, then those those scars can be used as um, helpful ways for insight. Yeah. And I say that with a caveat to say that we all need places where we can share out of our wounds where we're still bleeding and raw and hurting. And maybe those are close friends. Maybe that's a therapist or a spiritual counselor or a pastoral counselor or whomever, pastor, chaplain. We need places where we can we can share our wounds and help get some help and support in the process of, of creating scars over those. Um, but those should be very carefully decided spaces. Um, yeah. who, with whom will I share the bleeding wound with? And how can I use the wounds that have scarred in useful ways for the other that don't make me the focus of, of the caring attention? Yeah, that's great. It occurs to me as you say that, that a really good resource, and I don't mean this purely as a plug for the lab, but a really good resource for this, we have a, a group on Facebook for chaplains that, that, that it's just for chaplains. It's not hard to get into, but you do have to be a chaplain. Uh, but you can learn there about how other people are, are doing this exact kind of exercise. I'm not suggesting that that's the best place to share out of those wounds, but you can maybe learn there how other chaplains are doing that in a way that is healthy and productive. In, in dividing that line between sharing out of wounds and sharing out of scars. So thank you. Thank you, Barr, uh, for yeah. that. That's nice. uh, this is a really great practical question on how we can use this. I say we, I'm not a chaplain, on how chaplains can use this yeah. with the people they're working with. This question says, Cheryl, I wonder about asking these open-ended questions for people who are already overwhelmed. Sometimes mm -hmm. giving them choices between two or three things is less overwhelming. So do you have any advice on how to kind of adapt this for people who are maybe not in a place to really engage with this yet? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, it certainly is important to remind people of their power and their ability to answer their own questions with these open-ended questions that I share. And it's also important for the coach to know their client and to know what is going to the, be the most effective. So to ask a question that has a binary choice, either or, could help somebody get an anchor and then go from there to something more expansive. So uh, while my default is always open-ended, there, there are times when you want to ask questions that let people find themselves again. So if somebody's terribly upset, which has happened, and they're uh, saying, you know, they're doing the awfulizing. Uh, everything is awful. I can't get past it. The world is terrible. Every suggestion you make to them, they say that can't work. Then you might want to say, have you ever been in a situation where you felt like you had no control? And they may say yes or no. Then you say, well, what did you do? What helped you then? Who helped you? So just to recenter them so that they have an anchor can be useful. Sparingly, though, because when we start to ask those close ended or binary questions, oftentimes we're directing people to a path that we think they should go on. And we don't want to make sure that they're identifying their own path. And, Barr, I'm hoping that maybe you can jump in here a little bit. There was this question early on that I want to come back to that says, How do we support those who are so overwhelmed they can't even figure out what furniture has mm -hmm. been moved? Where, you know, they will, it's, 
I, I'm trying to extend the metaphor. They walk into the house and they realize something's different here, but they can't figure out what it is because they're just so overwhelmed. And it reminds me of, of some of the earlier webinars we had very early in the crisis with, with chaplains trying to figure out how to support staff who were sort of inclined to overwork because of the position they're in. Doctors and nurses who feel like I cannot slow down because there is need, so I have to keep going. Mm -hmm. You know, not being able to recognize that this is a unique moment in a unique circumstance that, it, you know, it's not just a busy Friday night in the ER. This is world historical. Um, so for people that are just so overwhelmed that that where to begin is difficult, Bar, I mean, what, what do you think about that? I, I think that's real. I, and first, I would want to name that and and encourage them to to put legs under that feeling. What what is what is that like? What are go back to some of the questions I had had offered a little bit earlier at the top of our time together. Um, what is it like to walk into a house and either there's no furniture there or there's you know someone is storing their entire apartment there or something um and and what and you know maybe go back to some of the other webinars where you mentioned there were some breathing exercise practices but anything to get people into the very moment into their body and there's some great contemplative practices around doing that how do we get really present and then how do we get some perspective you cannot save the world. You cannot save everybody in the ER tonight. Um, can, is, it, is it okay to do your best and to care for yourself as well as caring for other people? And what would caring for yourself look like? Maybe it's you take a half hour walk around the block. Maybe it's you take a break for a cup of coffee. Maybe you go home and have a good night's sleep. I don't know what that is. Um, but some some perspective, I think part of the challenge of this current crisis is that it's very easy to lose perspective. I mean, we all have blindfolds on right now and it's very difficult to see. And and maybe all we need to ask of ourselves and each other is just the next step, the very next thing. What are we being invited into the very next moment? Um, and I would say that in my in my class, I switched gears when we had to go online and, and I re really resisted. You can tell I really resisted the ramming up rapidly. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I said to my class, I had a class of 26 students. I said, we're not going to ramp, ramp up rapidly. We're going to take this opportunity to slow down, to become attentive, to get intentional, to get in touch, to get grounded, to become more aware. And students told me that that was really helpful for their perspective in managing the the overwhelm because this is a global there's no space that's not affected i there are a couple islands that are untouched but otherwise there's no space unaffected so how do we create space internally and interpersonally and institutionally um, that changes the value the nature of work can we understand productivity in a different way can we understand contemplation spaciousness, simplifying, quieting, grounding. Can we understand that as a different kind of important endeavor or a different kind of effort so that we can't expect students to write the same level of papers or the same number of papers or the same to read what they've been able to read before this hit? Is there a different work we're being invited to? Um, and can that different identification of work help us gain some perspective even as it's friday night in the er and it's a really bad one yeah i find myself as a caregiver i often feel like i can always do more i'm strong i can do more i can give more i can sleep less and when i take the time to take a 20 minute nap which i time i put the timer on for 20 minutes and i lay down and i take a nap I'm much better able to serve people and I have much more capacity and I'm better at what I do than I am when I'm stretching and pushing and going to the last second. So I think for those of us who get overwhelmed because we want to do more and more and be our best selves, that one of the ways we can be our best selves is to take a break and to time it or whatever is going to force us to just step away for a moment and then return and we'll find often that we're better than we were and the second thing i'll say beyond giving yourself some timed breaks 
is to be okay with good enough. This is good enough. It doesn't have to be 100%. It doesn't have to even be 95%. It's sometimes 80% will do and um, to be okay with being good enough. And I, I'm, I'm so grateful, especially Barr, to hear that, that you had this approach with your students because mm -hmm. anyone who is even remotely connected to higher education right now can tell you stories of institutions that really diverge so widely between, well, the only thing that changed is that we're going online now. Everything else remains mm -hmm. exactly the same, which to me is just, it, it's bonkers. Um, students are dealing with circumstances that that they didn't have to deal with when they were away at school their families are sick they're trying to get home this that and the other uh to expect the same level of work on everybody's part no matter where you are is just crazy and sure. i think that, that the other side of settling with what's good enough for myself is also and what's good enough for the people that i'm working with that i need things from whether it's students or direct colleagues or people that you that report to you or whatever to be gentle with them as well is is just as important because if if they just see if they only see this image of all you do is work and work and work and give then they think that's what they have to do as well and that's you know that's just a, a recipe for for disaster for sure. we have to understand that we've got to slow down it takes time to feel our way through this and so give ourselves and every, and those around us some grace yeah and personally, I, I hope that this is one of the silver linings we take away from this pandemic, mm -hmm. is that once we get into some, whatever the new normal is, to recognize that need for, for slowing down a little bit, um, even when you're not in crisis mode. Um, Donna, I, I'm gonna ask your question really quickly here, but I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. So let me just fire it off. And maybe uh, if, uh, if Cheryl and, and Barr can answer it in 30 seconds or less, we'll see. How do we help people process who believe the crisis is over and don't understand there is still a pandemic going on? That's a really great question. <laughs> how do you <laughs> how do you address this when people say, "Well, there is no problem"? Yes, this is the toughest part of what we do, isn't it? When people don't see what is going on or refuse to see, and I have learned that you cannot convince people outside of what they are committed to. So if they're not open to it and they're not willing to accept it, for me personally, I don't push it. I move on to somebody else. And I hope that's not too flippant, but you know, I just don't think we should try to move uphill. Before I uh, before I move on, I probably would would want to explore with them if I could. Um, the difficulty of staying in an anxious place, the desire to go back to, you know, the rubber band in its in its um, more familiar shape, the the difficulty of really staying in this unfamiliar, un uncomfortable place, and just mm -hmm. help and name and explore that. Well, thank you both so much for for your wisdom, and your time, and your energy. I say this, I think I've said it for almost every webinar, and if not, I apologize to those guests, but I'm just so grateful because you all are living through this like anybody else. Uh, you are not detached experts talking yeah. about this in an abstract manner. You're dealing with it too. And so we're really grateful for your time and your expertise. I'll Thank remind you. everyone, this is recorded. It will be online at chaplaincyinnovation.org and everybody who registered will get a link emailed them to, the, emailed to them so you're not gonna miss anything and we'll have all the materials there as well. Thank you both so much. Have a great afternoon, everyone, and we will see you next time. Bye-bye.